So, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I'm both uh, glad and surprised that so many of you survived the party yesterday. Um, so, welcome to my talk, Creating Games the Wooga Way. So, first, a bit about me. My name is Stefan. Uh, I learned Unity from this guy. That was back when uh, there was no Android support, and if you want to make a build for iOS, you actually had to use a separate editor. Um, back then, I was uh, working at a research facility in Berlin, focusing on research in um, human-computer interaction in games. So we did a lot of fun stuff like this project, where we basically created a racing track out of your own music files, and you could write on it using your own skateboard. Uh, besides that, we did lots of prototypes, basically investigating, controlling games with all kinds of devices and all kinds of body parts. Um, and after a while, we basically tried out all devices and all body parts. And I mean all body parts. Um, and so I decided maybe I take all the learnings that I made and start making some money. So I joined a company called Vuga. And it was seven years ago. It makes mobile games. Um, and by now, since I'm seven years there, I uh, get called principal engineer there, which basically means I have a gray beard. I need a standing desk to relieve the pain in my back. But I also got some awesome privileges. One of those is uh, basically I get to answer every annoying question that I get asked with the term for historical reasons. <laughs> and that's awesome. Um, OK, so let's have a look at what we will do today. So I will give you a short introduction to what VUGA actually is. Uh, then we look at what our biggest challenges are. Uh, then we have a deeper look into how we share stuff internally. Then how, how we deal with content, because that's an issue for us. And then we have a deeper look and into our, how we approach game architecture and scene management, especially. So about Vuga, Vuga was founded in 2009, so 10 years old. It's based in Berlin. We, last time I checked, we had about 220 employees. Probably today it's a bit more because we keep on growing at the moment. Uh, we consider ourselves experts in story-driven casual games. So all our casual games are really heavy on, on story and content. Uh, currently, we have five live games. You can see them on the, on the right side, and two in development. And we've started using Unity in 2013. By, co by coincidence, this is when I started at the company. Um, and yeah, in, this, in these years, we were quite busy. So on the right, you, uh, in the lower right, you see the, our wall of fame, where we basically keep a picture of every project that we ever did. Wall of fame is a bit misleading, because it should be walls of fame, like the uh, wall on the opposite side is actually the same. So we actually managed to do quite a few projects in these 10 years. Um, and maybe now it's time to share some of the learnings that we made. So, OK, so how do, are we set up? Basically, we have individual game teams, which means every game has its own team. Uh, the sizes of these teams obviously vary. So currently, it's between 20 and 40 people. And usually, we have between four and six front engineers, front end engineers, so Unity engineers, working on a game. Uh, on top of that, we have a lot of shared teams for services like marketing, HR, localization, all the stuff that you need for all the games. Uh, then we have a shared team for our um, tech art, so visual effects, animation, all that kind of stuff. We share the team between the game teams. Uh, and we also have a shared backend. So we have one dedicated team that works on backend, but the backend is basically for all, is used by all our games. Um, so what are the challenges that come from that? So yeah, first of all, knowledge and code sharing. Like every company that is a bit bigger has this problem. And with our team set, set up, this tends to be a problem as well, because uh, since we have individual game teams, sharing is not always great. Um, then we have uh, regular, sometimes even weekly, content updates to our story-driven games, which ends up with a huge asset catalog. Uh, then we have uh, a constantly growing uh, code base, because we also do feature updates regularly. Uh, but that is probably something that you all know. So let's go through them one by one. So how do we share stuff? So as I said, sharing is something with our team setup that is not so natural. Um, and we had lots of problems with that in the past. But we managed over the years to basically come up with solutions 
that now we can say basically sharing is like part of Vuga's culture and this is super important. So basically I think if you would have a graph of our success and a, uh, the graph of how good we are at sharing, they are probably uh, the same. Um, so how we, do, how we do that? So first of all, for sharing knowledge, we have some institutions on company level. One of these is we have regular five minutes of fame. That is where every member of a certain discipline, like engineering or game design, gets together, and then some people uh, hold small talks like this one, where they tell other people what, they, what cool things they did and what they learned in the recent uh, weeks. Um, then we have so-called guilds for like more specific knowledge sharing. So this might be uh, people cooperating on some shared tools or technology or uh, just uh, a ranting group about Facebook SDK. Um, on top of that, we also have weekly syncs between game teams that are related. So for instance, our live games, we see them as kind of related because usually they say they... Uh, face the same issues, like if Facebook goes down, like everyone is unhappy. Uh, if uh, we have a back-end problem also, mostly everyone is happy, uh, unhappy because uh, we share the back-end and stuff like that. And also for new, new games, we have lots of corporations because they build the same tools for the games. Um, then we are an IT company, so we have Slack channels for everything, that is obvious. Um, and then is, there's one thing that especially for engineering is uh, super important for us, and that is we do pull requests for everything. So whenever you commit something to any of our repositories, you have to go through a pull request and you have to do a code review. And that is not so much uh, because we don't trust our engineers, because I think they're all great and they know what they're doing, uh, but we see it more as uh, a way of like, actually sharing knowledge, because if you have to show your code uh, to someone else that, and you talk about it, then both engineers gain something because they probably increase the knowledge of a specific area of our code. And also a nice side effect is it uh, radically reduces the bus effect. So now we have at least one person who is dispensable. Um, okay, so the interesting part for engineers, obviously, is how do you share code? And first of all, I will tell you how we don't share code, because uh, we tried that for a long time, and basically we realized that uh, it's not a good idea to use monolithic frameworks, like have one framework, use it in every game, because usually all, every game is a little bit different, and then you also have these developers who tend to have like different views and opinions and stuff, and usually if you then force them to use a framework, then this is disaster. Um, and also, you should not use, uh, or we don't use a, s a specialized team just for developing frameworks and tools, because we learned that usually they are too detached and it's too hard to uh, cooperate them with them if you have like five or seven games at the same time and all have their different needs and then the, the, uh, the framework team just gets overwhelmed with requests, they don't have enough resources to fulfill everything and basically nothing works. So we went through that, so we will never do it again. Um, so what we do instead, we have a central team, but the central team is just providing infrastructure for our code sharing. So basically that's a, a build server that we use to publish packages and the package manager that we use to integrate packages. Um, and lots of tooling around it so we can actually discover packages, like have an overview over, over our dependencies and uh, stuff like that. And the idea is that everything, uh, like every tool and framework at uh, VUGA is uh, developed as like open source internally in VUGA. So that means every engineer actually uh, takes part in developing those tools, which is the nice thing about it is if you don't like it, you can change it. You still need to go through the pull request and have a code review and maybe be shut down by someone, but you actually have the chance to change something. Uh, so it's everyone's responsibility, which increases just the, uh, the buy-in and the quality of our stuff. Um, and then we also have a similar architecture in all our games, so not, not the same, this is very important to say. <laughs> but it's similar. So for us, it's easier to, put, uh, to take something out of one game, put it into another game, make some little adjustments to it, and it will just work. So our packages, we call them VUGA development kits. Um, on the baseline, we have basically used, uh, started using these packages to uh, have implementations, like client-side implementations for all our shared backend services. Uh, but then we uh, saw this system is great and we started other stuff. So for instance, we have uh, complete frameworks. So our puzzle games, for instance, share the same engine. 
and uh, also stuff that is used in most games like localization, dialogue system. Uh, we also have packages for that and we reuse that between games. Uh, then we also have like really small packages with just utility code. So this might be just a handy extension for getting a random element from a list or uh, stuff like editor utils. So, I don't know, rendering a serializable dictionary in the inspector, stuff that you always need and is never there and no one wants to write it. So we have a package for it. Um, and uh, so the way we approach it is we have separate repositories. So every package has a separate repository. In that repository, we have a Unity project. And that Unity project contains the code or the assets, uh, plus a lot of unit tests and examples. And when we actually want to publish uh, a new version of that, um, Basically, all the examples and tests are stripped out, so in the package you only get the, the stuff that you actually want, not all the uh, extra stuff. But the good thing is when we actually build the package, uh, we can run all these unit tests before to ensure that actually the stuff that you get just works. Um, so with that, also, we need a package manager to work. Uh, currently, for historic reasons, we have our own package manager. Uh, mainly because we started using pa package manager because you know, before Unity was talking about having a package manager. Um, so ours is based on NuGet and uh, Paket, like a lot of other people use. Uh, the advantage that we have over the currently over the Unity package manager, uh, we also have disadvantages. But the advantage is we have uh, pessimistic versioning, so we can basically pin packages to certain versions. Uh, and we get the full support from NuGet Gallery. So if we need any extra C-sharp packages, it's super easy for us to just get it. Um, this the whole thing is run by, by Jenkins infrastructure that we use for automated releases and, and publishing those builds, as I already mentioned. So the, the workflow is basically you change the code in the GitHub repository, you go through the code review and the pull request, you push it, uh, the automated uh, servers uh, will just create a new snapshot. If you're happy with the snapshot, you, we can uh, press a button and just release a new version, and then everyone can use it or stay on his old version if we break something. Um, and that's quite neat. And we also run tests against uh, like every Unity version that anyone in the company is using, uh, because we all know if you write code for one Unity version, that doesn't really mean that it works in another Unity version, depending on which API, uh, which API you are targeting. So why do we want pessimistic versioning? Just a quick overview. Uh, so basically, we, we can pin stuff to certain ranges of versions, which for us is important because uh, we have multiple games. And basically, uh, our Unity project range from 2017.4 to 2019.3 beta, whatever is the latest thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so we need to. Uh, mediate between those. Uh, then also, usually we tend to test new features in our packages just in one game, and we don't want it to release it like to every game, uh, because like everyone, we do mistakes, and we don't want to fuck up like every game just because we fuck up one package. Uh, and on top of that, we also have a lot of transitive dependencies, like package A is depending on package B and package C, and package D is uh, depending on package C, and then they require different versions, and this is all a complete nightmare if you don't have pessimistic versioning, because then you end up like bumping versions left and right, and you don't get anything done anymore. Uh, and that is the thing for, that for us is still missing from the Unity uh, package manager, but I heard rumors that they are actually working on fixing this, so maybe we switch to the Unity package manager soon. So, next challenge for us is uh, dealing with content. So, as I said, we have huge content. Uh, what, so, first of all, what, what is content? So, for us, content is not everything in the game. For us, content is basically uh, the stuff that keeps getting updated on a regular basis. So, that might be uh, levels and puzzle games, uh, our story-related assets like dialogues, quests, and characters, uh, or hidden object scenes in our hidden object games, uh, or stuff like ISO items. So basically everything that is consumed by a player on a regular basis and we need to provide new stuff all the time. That for us is content. Um, so why do I think our content is so big? So let's give you an example. So this is... Uh, taken from uh, Pearl's Peril, one of our older games. And this is like one hidden object scene. 
So if you don't know hidden object games, it's basically a huge, uh, beautiful scene where we hide a lot of items in there, and then the user has to actually find those items. Um, so this it comes in a Photoshop file that is roughly 250 megabytes. Uh, I checked, we also have ones that are 320 megabytes, so, but let's say it's 250. Uh, in these uh, Photoshop items, you will find like 75 plus items uh, which are spread on four different layers in Photoshop, so the whole thing evaluates to roughly 300 PNGs that we get when we ex extract the stuff from the Photoshop file and put it into Unity. Uh, unfortunately, we don't just have like one of these scenes, we have like uh, two, three, four, five per chapter. Chapter is basically what we, uh, like the, uh, yeah, what we call the, the weekly content, so there's one chapter per week, and we have five of these scenes per week. Uh, on top of that, we also have like ISO items and adventure scenes and new characters and cutscenes and daily puzzles. And oh, did I mention that this is old? So we have 90 chapters. And this overall uh, leads to build times of one week <laughs> per platform. Uh, of course, we can speed this up by just throwing more machines at it because it's like. You can parallelize it very well, but this is, I think, an example that uh, the Pulse Parallel engineer gave me. Uh, it's like building the content for iOS on, on two Mac minis. So it, it's quite massive. Uh, so how, how are we dealing with this? So we have this awesome thing we call the content pipeline. So just bear with me. I know it looks intimidating. I will, look, uh, I will walk you through it. I also know it's super ugly. But as I already mentioned, probably I'm an engineer and I'm lazy. <laughs> so this is how pictures have to look. Um, so before I start walking you through it, uh, one disclaimer. So this is not a silver bullet. This is just how we do it. It might completely not match with what you do, or maybe you even have a better approach. It's just maybe use this as an, as an inspiration, like how we do this. Okay, so the main idea, and I've heard that a lot of times, so it's probably not something new to you, we just separate the content from the Unity project completely. So why are we doing this? I mean, everyone who has worked on a big Unity project probably knows the feeling. You, do, you move a folder in Unity, and then you grab a cup, of, a cup of coffee, and then you come back, and then you see that you moved the folder to the wrong place. Um, yeah, so to avoid that, we just keep the content completely out of the Unity project, which gives us a fast Unity project. Of course, then the question arises, how the fuck do we edit this content if it's not in the Unity project? Well, there's like two ways of dealing with it. One way is some of our games, actually most the, the 2D games, the content is just created in Photoshop files, and those Photoshop files actually never see the Unity project. Uh, we just have automated processes that basically run scripts that extract all the PNGs from the Photoshop files, uh, create scenes out of the PNGs, and then create asset bundles out of the scenes, uh, and then we just pull the asset bundles. So they are actually never in the Unity project, like for any developer. Uh, but we also have games that uh, are more 3D and actually need editing within Unity, and then obviously this is a problem because there is no content. So what we do is we just zoom link the part of the content that we want to edit into the project, edit the content, save it, and then remove the zoom link. So the content is gone from the Unity project. Uh, that worked quite well. Uh, the problem with zoom linking seems to be that non-engineering personnel seems to think this is hard and confusing. So we just have a utility for them that lets them create zoom links safely, they can remove them safely, uh, and it works on Windows and Mac. And also comes with nice things that actually in the project you can see what is zoom link and what is not zoom link. So far that works pretty well for us, uh, and it allows you, us to still keep the content separated. So, but now how do we get the assets, like the content, into the game? Well, that's easy. So we have this content folder. Uh, every time you make a change in the content folder, you just push to the version control system. The version control system then fires off uh, a build job on our Jenkins servers, which knows how to build the asset bundles and which asset bundles to build. Um, and then it just creates all the asset bundles together with the main manifest so we can actually see or like find them again in the CDN uh, and just uploads everything to the CDN. So awesome. Now all our content is online. 
we are done, right? Because now we can just download in the, it in the client. That's all we need, right? Well, not really, because you probably all know this feeling when you have this epic game that you always wanted to play, like you, you, uh, you're looking forward to playing it since weeks, and then you have this long train ride coming up, like eight hours from Berlin to Copenhagen, and you install this game and say, awesome, I'm on the train, I want to start playing the game. And then this happens. So maybe it's not a good idea to just have online content. Maybe we also need to put some of the content into the application. Um, so we have, we have to distinguish between remote content on CDN and like bundled content which is delivered with the application. So bundled content is basically just asset bundles that we put into streaming assets, so they are delivered with the application. Um, and those contain everything that is needed for the first session. Unfortunately, the first session is defined by a game designer. And I don't know why, but game designers tend to change their mind every five minutes. Um, so it's a very good idea to make this configurable. So we can just configure what is bundled and what is not bundled. Um, yeah, and then we have the remote content, which is just available through CDN download and will be downloaded on demand by the client, although on demand means we have some prediction logic to try to preload stuff that we think the user is, uh, is needing in the next time. Uh, and then, so we get to this part, so this is basically, we build the client, we, when we build the client, we have some deployment rules where we configure what is bundled and what is not bundled, and then based on the deployment rules, we just download the asset bundles that we need for deployment, put them into the application, and release the application. Um, and uh, then at, at runtime, when the app needs something, it just first checks if it already has that in the local content. If it doesn't have that in the local content, it just uses the remote manifest, which we deliver through our config service, kind of like uh, Unity's remote config, but for historical reasons, we have our own config service. Um, yeah, and then basically can download whatever content it needs from CDN. Uh, to do this all in a sane manner, we have our own asset bundle manager, which is just based on Unity's asset bundle manager that they released uh, a few years ago on Bitbucket. We did some heavy modifications to it uh, and basically are using it in all our games. Um, so the nice thing is it automatically resolves dependencies. So if I load an asset from an asset bundle that depends on 10 other asset bundles, the asset bundle manager will just make sure that everything is loaded that I need. So in the end, I just get the asset and everything is fine. Um, yeah, it uh, provides us the op uh, option to configure what is in app and what is in CDN. And on top of that, that is the nice thing that, that, that the Unity uh, asset bundle manager provided back then is uh, an easy way to switch between uh, simulation mode and CDN mode. So what this means is if we are in CDN mode, we are actually using the exact same assets that the client would use. We download everything from CDN, which for me as an engineer is awesome because I don't need any fucking assets in my project. Everything is super fast and I can just work. Uh, that obviously doesn't work for content editors because they actually need to modify the content and see what changes. So they use simulation mode, which then falls back to the, your local assets, which also means you have to symlink the, the part of the content that you're working on into the project, um, but so we can have both. Um, and yeah. So the feature set is very similar to addressables. So I mean, for historical reasons, we have the asset bundle manager. Um, and we are still sticking with it, uh, mainly for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is uh, with our bundle manager, we have like full control of packaging. There's no like magic behind the scenes thing going on. And the other thing is uh, mainly uh, most of us are fucking old and we are super afraid of new stuff. <laughs> So, no, no, but seriously, I mean, we use it in, uh, in five released games and it works, so why change it? It just does what we want. Um, okay, so that's our content pipeline. Say goodbye to this nice picture. We move on to the next thing, how we deal with regular feature updates and the constantly growing code base. So this is something that you usually tackle with good game architecture. The thing is, what is a good game architecture? If you ask 10 engineers, you get 30 answers. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so take all this with a grain of salt. So, uh, so we have, uh, first of all, we have some requirements, and these are like 
the, the same for all of our games. And the first requirement is probably also the same for everyone. Uh, that is that you want to guarantee that uh, testing and developing new, fi new features is fast and easy. That's obvious, right? Uh, then the next is, uh, since we have fairly big teams and lots of people working on content, we also want to avoid merge conflicts because we used to have these a lot. Uh, next requirement is uh, our code needs to be aware that stuff might not be ready or not even on the client because we download the most of the stuff on demand. That has some extra problems. Then uh, new developers should just know how to do stuff. So if you are a big company, you get new people all the time and then some people leave and you get other people. And uh, uh, so the architecture should be set up in a way that is pretty clear how to do stuff and there's not much leeway where you can go wrong. Because otherwise you need one extra developer who just handholds new developers, which sucks. Um, okay, so these are our requirements. And again, disclaimer, no silver bullet. Uh, so we came up with uh, some rules. And so I know that um, game architecture is a very sensitive, tof sensitive topic for engineers. Uh, I know that because we have the same problem at, at uh, VUGA. So even we can't on, agree on one specific implementation of game architecture. But what we can agree us, on is a set of rules that we follow. And the implementation might differ, but the rules are more or less the same throughout the teams. So what are these rules? So first of all, we try to split up everything into as many scenes as possible. That is mainly to avoid merge conflicts. But it also comes with a nice side effect that it kind of forces you to think about your game a bit more modular because you have to separate everything into different uh, scenes and parts, which, in my opinion, also improves your code quality. Um, then we try to keep business logic, like everything that modifies the game state, out of mono behaviors because usually that leads to uh, problems. Uh, one problem is uh, that if everything is in mono behaviors, it's much harder to test. So if it's not in mono behaviors, it's much easier to test. Uh, and the other thing is that some of our games uh, run simulations to determine, like, uh, uh, to investigate economy and balancing and stuff like that. And it's also much easier if you just pull it out of game behaviors, uh, of mono behaviors. And uh, so the next thing is you need to ensure dependencies are actually ready when they are used because of our problem that we don't know what we actually have as content. Uh, then game scenes need to run standalone in the editor. So if I have a scene and, and the scene is just a pop-up, uh, if I press the play button, I want to actually see what the pop-up would do when I started, like what animation is seen, what's the state and everything. And I don't want to go through the whole fucking game, like start it from scratch, click through the whole game until I see the pop-up. I don't want that. Um, and then a sequence of events needs to be controlled from one single method. We will see what I mean with that later. Um, but basically, it helps to make everything more sane. Um, and finally, use events and callbacks only if you absolutely have to. So I worked in a lot of projects. And usually, uh, if, if you start out using a lot of events to decouple your stuff, then in the beginning, you're super happy because everything is super decoupled. And then two years later, uh, you start to realize, OK, everything is super decoupled. But now, if I have a bug, I need like two hours to figure out like in which order uh, people register to which events. And it's just a pain in the ass to figure this out. So we just try to avoid this. So splitting up scenes as much as possible. Uh, so what do I mean with that? So we use multiple scenes for seemingly easy things. So in this example, you see uh, Tropicats, one of the projects I worked on previously. And basically, uh, on there, you see, OK, you have the, the, the top bar, and you have the right bar with the icons. You have the left bar with some icons. You have the bottom bar with some buttons. And then you have uh, all these UI elements on the map. And you have the map itself, like the island. And basically, everything is a separate scene. So we, can, we just load them additively, which is super nice because, for instance, the, we can reuse the resource bar in every other screen of the, of the game. It's always the same resource bar in the same scene. We just uh, load it together with other scenes. Um, and it allows like, uh, our artists to, or the UI artists to work on parts of the game or parts of the UI separately. 
Of course, with that also comes a big problem, like you need to manage this somehow, because somehow need, we need to ensure that everything is loaded that we need, and uh, we need to be sure that everything is actually ready when we start using it. Um, for, for this, we have a specific architecture, which I call the scene roots architecture. So the basic idea is we, we have a scene manager. Again, for historic reasons, it's not Unity scene manager, it's our scene manager. Um, and the, the idea is super simple. The scene manager loads a scene, and the scene manager keeps a reference to the scene, so the scene manager always knows what is loaded. Uh, on top of that, we also have a system that uh, we can declare dependencies between scenes. So let's say scene A has a dependency on scene B, then the scene manager knows, okay, if you load scene A, you, I also need to load scene B for you. And because, just because it's nice, it will also just uh, give the reference to scene B to scene A so I can communicate between the two scenes. Um, and then next to it, we have the main context. So yes, we use dependency injection, but just like a really, really, really slim framework for that. Uh, and within that context, we have so-called services. So services, basically everything that interacts either with the game state or with outside of the game. Uh, and then we have the game state. And basically, this, the game state, at least in our projects, is set up in a way that it's actually impossible to access it through everything but the service. So even if a developer really wants to modify the game state in the mono behavior, he can't. It's just not possible. Um, OK, so let's look at how those scenes look like. So basically, they all follow the same pattern. So there's always one game object, which is the root of the scene. Um, and attached to this is a mono behavior, which we call the scene root. But there's a distinct type for every scene. So the map might have a, a mono behavior, and the UI has a different mono behavior attached to it. Uh, and there's also a naming convention between uh, scene name and the name of the type of the mono behavior. So as you can see in this example, if it's called scene root example, then the scene root would be called scene root example root, which is a stupid name, but uh, it's just an example. So why are we doing that? Because then we can do something which we call type safe loading. Because one of the most annoying things to me always was why do I have to load a, a, a scene by its name? using a string. I mean, every engineer knows or gets shivers if he needs to load stuff by string. Uh, so what we can do is basically we have a generic method. So we have the scene manager, and then we can just say scene manager load, and we just pass the type of the scene that is uh, associated with the scene that we want to load, and then it just loads the correct scene, which is nice in itself, but also has the side effect since it's a generic method, and I know which type I'm loading, if I await it, I can just get the reference directly and start doing things with it, which, especially in stuff like tutorials, is super useful because I just load like whatever I would need to, and then I can interact with it immediately. Uh, there's a different. There, there's some some trickery going on because, like, uh, when when Unity says the scene is loaded, that that doesn't actually mean that it's a good idea to use it because that just means that all the game objects are somehow in your memory. It doesn't mean necessarily that all the start methods have run or whatever you want to do. So we uh, differentiate between just loading the scene and waiting until it's actually initialized. Uh, but that's the main idea. So how does the scene root look like? So basically, that, that's the very basic example of one of the scene roots that is attached to the root game object. And here you can see like the, the three main mechanisms that this provides. So first of all, we have this attribute called inject scene. This is basically how we mark dependencies between scenes. This means if I load the scene root example, it automatically knows it has to load the map root, which is the scene with the map in it. Uh, and it will inject it once it's loaded. Uh, same way, we have the classic inject attribute. In this case, we just uh, uh, inject the inventory service, which also has to be ready because the game state has to be downloaded from the server. So we also have to wait until this is ready. And then the third mechanism is the go method. And that's basically the, the, the center of the whole architecture because the go method is basically our replacement for start and awake. So you are forbidden to use start and awake in our projects. Um, so instead, you have to use the go method. And the go method just guarantees that every dependency that you declared is ready. So if you use the go method, you can just hack away and you can be sure that everything is there all the time you need it. Um, OK, so the, in this little example, I just have set up two labels. 
uh, one gets the amount of energy that we currently have, and the other just gets the name of the map scene, just for the sake of argument that you can see that we can actually easily interact between scenes. Uh, and I made a short uh, screen recording of this. So here you can see the, uh, the scene route. There are our two labels. Now I hit play and Unity starts loading. And since we have a dependency on the map route and the map route itself has a dependency on lot of, lots of other stuff, it actually loads lots of other stuff and basically pulls up everything that is needed to fulfill the task of uh, read the energy amount, put it into label, and read the name of the map scene and put it into the label. Um, and that is already the first part of the next rule, ensure dependencies are ready when they are used. Because you saw everything seemed to be ready, we, we had no crashes, uh, seems to work somehow. And the idea behind is we always do async injection. So there's no way to just do in inject. So you always have to do inject async which means you have to await it, because if you don't await it, you at least get a compiler warning. So everyone should know that he can't just inject stuff. And this async injection basically uh, checks if the services that we are using are actually initialized, if they are something that needs to be initialized. And they also check that uh, if we load scenes, that every scene is loaded that we have as a dependency, and also uh, those other dependent scenes are all ready, and only then we call the go method, and then you're safe. Um, so next rule, UI and game scenes need to run standalone in the editor. This was also like kind of shown, because I had this like small scene which just had two labels, and it pulled an, up everything that it needed to actually fulfill uh, its purpose. Um, but this goes one step further, because uh, this was just a stupid example. But where it's like super useful is imagine you are a UI artist or you have UI artists that, that work on like very specific parts of your UI, like a single pop-up or just the, the shop or something. And then it's, as I said before, it's super uh, uh, annoying if you have to run the whole game and click through the whole game to just get to the point where you actually see your changes and then you see, okay, changes were not good enough, switch off the editor, do the whole thing again. So what we actually want to achieve is that you can easily like set the state of this uh, UI scene and look how it looks in a certain state. So the idea behind this is uh, we define the, uh, the whole state that this UI scene needs to present itself as one object and we make the object serializable. So you can only have stuff in there that Unity knows how to serialize. Um, and then we have one single entry point to change the state. So we pass the whole state in, and then the show method just knows what to do, like which game object to switch on, what to uh, switch off, like which label needs to be updated. That is all in this single entry point. So in this example, uh, I again just have two labels where I can assign like different uh, texts, and there's just one extra thing that uh, if I assign the text hidden to one of them, then it just disappears, uh, just for the sake of argument. So, uh, and since our data is serializable, we can expose it to the inspector. So the, the UI artist can just set up the state in the inspector and then see how it looks. And we can even take this a step further, because usually if you, have, if you need to test different states, it's also annoying if you have to change the state all the time. So actually we came up with something where you can basically the UI artist can save his test cases in the inspector and then just switch between them. So the way we do it is we just have a little wrapper around the actual data, uh, which is exposed to the inspector. And then there's uh, an interface that is implemented that basically gets a callback from the inspector when we switch, when we switch between those test cases. Well, this is how it looks like. So we have the scene root again, we have the two labels. Within the scene root, now we have this test data exposed. If you, if you open the test data array, we see there are like three different test cases in there. Uh, if you expand them, this is just a wrapper around the data, so there are just like strings in there that uh, we assign to the labels. And now we can just click on the button and it just switches the state and does the thing that it does. And this works in the editor, but you can do the exact same thing with the exact same method also at runtime. So if, even if you want to check how animations look like if you change state, you can just do that. And that, that is like a huge uh, help for our UI artists because it just makes them way faster. Um, last rule, 
a sequence of events needs to be controlled from one single method. Uh, the approach is fairly easy, so I mean everyone probably knows the command pattern, so basically you have an object that just has one function. Um, we just have async commands where we implement an async method, so it could be a coroutine, in this case it's a, uh, it's an awaitable async method. Um, and the idea with that is, so a sequence might be something like a tutorial. So the classic tutorial uh, highlights something, wait until the user clicked on it, then highlight the next thing, wait until the user clicked on it, show a pop-up, and so on, and so on, and so on. And uh, usually these things uh, tend to get super messy, so we try to keep it like within one area of code, so we can easily follow the flow and see what it's actually doing. It also has a nice side effect if the designer decides, okay, we want to highlight this object before the other object, you just switch lines, that's all. Um, and we use that basically for, for every sequence of events. So this example is from the current prototype, where basically we are on the map that you saw earlier, then uh, we start a, a round of puzzle game, we wait until the puzzle game is done, then we get some kind of results from it. We start the uh, reward flow, which shows all the pop-up, depending on uh, how good you were at the match three game. Um, and then we switch back to the map, and depending on how, much, how many rewards you got, we have to highlight a certain area of the map. And this is all like, con included in this small piece of code. O obviously, we can also nest those uh, async commands if we have more complicated processes. But for us, this is a like, really great help uh, with dealing with these sequences. Uh, one side note, I know yesterday there was a quite good talk about async, versus, uh, async await versus coroutines. So just uh, uh, my quick uh, summary of this. Why are we using it? Because, I mean, everyone by now knows that async await creates lots, of, lots more overhead than coroutines. Uh, so maybe it's not a good idea, and also async await is not really supported by Unity because all the async stuff in Unity is still done with coroutines and async results. Uh, but the uh, syntax is just so much nicer. <laughs> I mean, when I started my new project, I basically took the framework from the last uh, game, which was done with, uh, with coroutines, and rewrote it, the, the exact same thing, just with async await, and basically it reduced my code side by fac factor three, because usually uh, if you do something with coroutines and you have return values, so first of all you need a wrapper for the coroutine, and then usually you end up writing three lines. One is get something, then you, you await the operation, and then you get the result out of it. With async await I can do that in just one line. Um, then return values and exception handling, you get that out of the box. With coroutines, you need like uh, interesting wrappers, and then they tend to go wrong. Uh, with async await, it just works like you would expect. And also, uh, it's easy to extend it, so it's super easy to just make all the Unity API awaitable. So async result, coroutines, IE numerator, you can just await that. Uh, on top of that, if you, if you already started extending, it's also easy to uh, await stuff like a Unity event or a C-sharp event, which is also super nice to have because it makes your code much cleaner. Okay, uh, to wrap it up, um, split up your scenes as much as you can. Use async injection when you have async dependencies, uh, separate your content from your Unity project if you value your time, um, and do pull requests. The, the, these help a lot. Uh, and if you follow all these rules, then you can probably build your own paradise in no time. So, last hint, we are hiring, so if you're looking for a job, uh, you can check uh, the the link up there. If you have further questions, you can either approach me afterwards or just feel free to write me an email. Okay, so I'm done, and I think we are through with the time, so I don't think we have time for questions, but I will be outside, so just approach me if you have a question.